Design and art plays a major, major, major role in how we craft and cultivate culture. Um, and that it is one of the things that I think is probably missing the most from public health interventions with regards to behavior change. Um, I'm originally trained as a dietitian. Actually, I take that back. I'm originally trained as a diplomat, um, which is interesting that you also have a sort of journalism and State Department background, we'll say. Um, but then I went into public health and I started really getting into what it is that really drove why people did what they wanted to do. Um, and I work at the Open Agriculture Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. Um, so I've spent a lot of time working on the consumer side of behavior change as a dietitian for the last 15 years or so, particularly with low-income women and children. Um, I flipped that and I've gone to the beginning of the food supply chain and I work more uh, in the production side of food now. Because changing behaviors, as we've already discussed, is difficult. Um, there are opportunities to do so all across the spectrum of the value and supply chain in food. Um, and I try and focus on the beginning of the food supply chain because I think with regards to agriculture um, or production of food, there's also lots of opportunity there. But it's not a place where you'd think you'd find a lot of art or design. Um, so something, just a little bit of background, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the Media Lab at MIT, but we're sort of the red-headed, freckled stepchild of the MIT system. Um, MIT is known for its science and engineering, right? Um, the Media Lab takes science and engineering and adds a little bit of sprinkly fairy dust of art and design to that. Um, and it's because we believe truly that the, the sort of creative magic that can happen when we're trying to uh, just create something, that energy comes from a combination of science, art, engineering, and design. So it's not like the rest of MIT. Um, and certainly my lab is a weird mix of all of that as well. Uh, so this is something that I want us to just focus on for a little bit. This is from the principal investigator for the Mediated Matter Group. She calls this Krebs cycle of creativity. How many of you remember the Krebs cycle from your biology classes? So the Krebs cycle is how we create ATP, right? How we, our cells create energy. And Neri Oxman, who's the PI of this group, says, all right, not only does that happen biologically, but it also happens culturally. Um, and so when we're talking about changing behavior, you're not going to change behavior with uh, more information, more knowledge necessarily. You're going to do it by changing hearts and minds. So one way of thinking about this too is that we're moving from sort of the raw materials of food through. You can see this as like a gyroscope. You can look at it as a compass. You can see it as a clock. But what I want us to focus on today is moving from this knowledge side here where science and engineering is. Does everybody see the knowledge? And you move upwards through the information from nature to culture, because we're talking about changing behavior. Um, and art and design is really the space where we can help frame a new perception of behavior change. Um, it, it is a place where we have some tools at our disposal to trigger both a cognitive and an emotional response. And I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Laszlo Nehi. Um, he and Georgi Kepps are some of the, the founders of, of what we know as American design. Um, the Institute of Design in Chicago is um, Nehi's legacy. But I like this quote because it focuses on the emotion behind the chaotics of our life, right? And when we're talking about low-income folks, and we're talking about meeting people where they are, which is taking away this sort of... Um, uh, moral rectitude, I think is what we said about people just need more information. It's this finger waggy feeling of like, they just need more. It's they, they, they. What we're actually talking about is all of us. Any human being needs something to give us a sort of emotional validity to what is going to be a complex and chaotic life for all of us. If you factor in resource scarcity, particularly folks who just don't have as much resources to their name, this becomes even more important. So, um, this is another thing I want to think about. So neurologically, we are feeling creatures that think. We're not thinking creatures that feel. I'm just going to let that sit in for just a second. Because we have to get to the emotion. Um, and this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, is that we can address taste sort of biologically created, but we also need to talk about the tastes that our culture brings to us, right? Um, tastes that are given to us by our grandmothers or our mothers or our parents or our schools or our churches or our workplaces. And how do those sort of cultural tastes begin? And what I'm positing is that they start with emotion. Um, and so this is not news, right? If you follow behavioral economics, if you've studied, if you've read Nudge, if you 
look a little bit into the world of changing behavior. This isn't a new thing. BJ Fogg is someone who works at Stanford. He runs something called the Captology Lab. Some of you may be familiar. But the reason why I like this is because this is another way of addressing the need for demand. Um, demand is this motivation side here, right? Like if we're motivated, if we have a sort of emotional motivation to do something, if we have the ability to do so, and ability includes, as Lauren said, affordability, access, um, the environment can provide a trigger for us. And when you have those three things at the same time, that means that you've got behavior change. And this isn't just for food, this can include anything. So like I said, I work in a lab that focuses on producing food using technology, and I'll go into more of that later. Uh, but we're talking about three magical things happening, and how do you get those three magical things to happen at the same time? I'm positing that it's creation of culture using art and design tools that we probably, the, the industry uses really, really well in the public health sector, in the research sector, um, and in the sort of intervention in public health space. We're not doing as good a job at this. Um, this is the dual process model. Like I said, this is not new, but I just want to hone in on the cognition side and the emotion side. There have been lots of things said today that I just, I just want to point out because we're hearing this over and over and over. Um, so culture is sort of where we act without thinking, right? This is something Claude Fischler is an anthropologist who works in this space and has done for a long time. Um, and so when we hear things like we, we want people to be able to do things without them even knowing it, as Dr. Abdullah said earlier, um, how do we give people rules that they might incorporate into their lives? What is our new sort of um, economia, as Carolyn Steele said earlier, this is the, new, the new household rules, what are those? Those come when you're not thinking about them. It's just a, it's a thing that just happens without anybody telling you to. It's habitual, it's fast, you're not thinking about it. We act on this side, this emotional side, when we have lots of cognitive dissonance, when we're distracted, when we're busy, and this is all of us, right? This is not just low-income folks in, in, or in, folks in the developing world. We can't rely on the cognition, the information, the knowledge. We have to get to the sort of culture of it being what drives, because that's where we act without thinking. It's just part of our rules. Um, and just to be really quick about it, I want to give an example of this. Um, we were talking a lot about how does industry play in this. Um, if anyone is familiar, and I think maybe Dr. Obola was, were you referencing Brian Wansink from the Cornell Food and Brand Lab earlier? Um, the, some of the quotes about eating habits that I noticed earlier. The Cornell Food and Brand Psychology Lab is run by someone named Dr. Brian Wansink, who is working really closely with Google Food. Google Food employs hundreds of thousands of people all across the, the world. Um, and what they have started to do is incorporate some of these environmental changes, relying on the emotional side of eating habits, right? So they're placing the food that is healthier within eye distance. They're using nine to 10 inch diameter plates. Um, they're working very closely with academia to put this sort of research out into um, application in the industry. And it's a really good case study. I recommend following up on it and reading about what Google Food is doing to enable their employees to be healthier by design, um, specifically by designing the environments around them and also creating a culture around um, healthier habits. The Lucky Iron Fish is another example of how design changed a whole bunch of behaviors very quickly, specifically iron deficiency anemia in the developing world, but it was a design response, right? Um, if you remember Carolyn Steele earlier this morning talked about um, White Castle. Do you remember White Castle, the reference she made, was a design response essentially to consumer concerns about food safety. Um, so these are, these are examples of this already in practice. It's actually working. Um, there is a big, wide research space open for this um, because a lot, of, a lot of what we're talking about, the sort of intuition, the emotional response, the non-conscious processing, we aren't aware of what it is and it's difficult to measure that, but that is where we need to be measuring to figure out what it is as far as changing behavior or changing culture it includes both the cognitive and the emotional. How do we begin to measure that and see what interventions that rely on that emotional response actually can do to change behavior? Um, so I'm giving you these as an example. I think that they're, Google in particular, for better or for worse, is a powerful influencer. It's just like we were saying, industry with Walmart, with Amazon buying Whole Foods. This is how we're creating a new culture 
around food and uh, the food system. It doesn't have to rely on just the consumers, right? And we've heard this as well. This is sort of what my work is at the Open Agriculture Initiative, is infusing more design into the production side of the food supply chain. And I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, um, more specifically, because we're creating technology tools to help allow people to produce food wherever they are. Uh, in an open source way. So making it open source means that there is uh, now another, another method, another tool to create or produce food at a hyper local level and it's open to more people. What my role is is to make sure that if you build it, it doesn't mean that they're going to come. This is something that we have to sort of cultivate. Um, and so my role is to try and design those technologies and, and those tools to empower people through a new sort of culture around food and to include them in this identity of a farmer, for example, making them think that they can be farmers as well. So I'll talk more about that tomorrow, but I just wanted to throw in art and design here as another tool in our toolbox that I think could probably be used even more appropriately. Um, we are in Denmark, Danish design is sort of like the hallmark of good design, so um, thank you. <laughs>